Hurry up. Mm. Rattling paper. <laughs> <laughs> Mark chapter 1. I had not thought about a lot of that that I've shared with you so far today. In fact, I haven't thought about Wendy for a long time. Amazing how thoughts come back to you in the midst of conversations, isn't it, of, of all of that. That was such a divine time in Hong Kong. You know, had I known, again, it's always hindsight's always wonderful things, isn't it? But had I known... Um, Leonard Ravenhill and his preaching. Matter of fact, one of the sermons I was listening to right before I come over here, he was talking about a woman that's in Hong Kong. She was a British citizen. Of course, he was too. He was English. And uh, moved by the Holy Spirit, 18, 19 year old kid, bought a one way ticket. She said, Lord, here's my life. Use me however you want to use me. And she went to her pastor and said, I don't have a clear calling about where to go, uh, mission-wise, what place, what continent, anything like that. He said, then just buy a ticket and wherever the Lord, get on the boat, and wherever the Lord tells you to get off, get off. <laughs> now, would you have faith to obey like that? That's, that's walking in faith. You know, when that says we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith, faith. that's faith. So she bought a ticket, bought it to China, started going up and down the, the coast, the east coast of China, and I think the Lord told her to get off in, um, oh, my mind just went blank. What's the, uh, not Singapore, but uh, Hong Kong. Not Hong Kong. On up. Where's my map? <laughs> Wasn't Beijing, Shanghai. She got off in Shanghai. And then eventually, I think she got down into Hong Kong. She went, went south and ended up there. Uh, just incredible what she would do. Uh, and, and, and never return, never come back to Britain, just stayed there and, and has ministered. And she's been there, uh, I think she's in her 50s or 60s now. So she's been there for 40, 50 years and just labored there. But she would go out on the streets, get the prostitutes, and bring them back into her house and, and, and try to get them out of that and to give them Christ. She took on the gangs. The gangs revered her. Uh, even though they didn't agree with her, they had respect for what she was doing. The opiate uh, uh, addicts that are on the streets. And she would bring them. She, she, they asked her, they said, what was the hardest thing that you had to do? She said, sharing my house with 18 other people. She never had an empty house. She had it in her house, in her bedroom, sleeping. She was like, you pour a bucket of water over your head to wash your hair and to wash yourself. And she said, never any privacy. And she said, the door always open for people coming and going and that. But what, you know, what a testament about that. But just those kind of things. Had I known when I was in Hong Kong that she was there, I would have definitely... Uh, looked her up for that. But again, to think back and just to reminisce for a moment of those that prayed, prayed over them. Uh, on the line opportunity, you know, again, Ravenhill said it. He said, I never know a person until I pray with them. And, and I think, how true is that? When you listen to someone pray, you hear their heart in that. That's, that's deep in the midst of that. So it's like, let's pray. And it's not just one sided, you know, oh, Dan, you pray. Uh, but it's let's pray, us, let's pray together in the midst of this. So a lot of these things in mind and heart right now. But how much is that song that we just sang, Breathe on Me? Did, did you pray that or did you just sing it? Breathe on me, Holy Spirit. Uh, fill me uh, with the Pentecostal power there for that. Great need, great need of that. All right, Mark chapter 1. I keep going, I'm going to change my sermon. Uh, verse 21 again Mark chapter 1 where Jesus is just beginning his ministry what a testament what we talked last night about this and I don't know how I'm in my Bible reading I don't know how many times I saw astonished uh, 
today in my Bible readings, and it's here too in chapter 1 uh, that we were talking about last night at the prayer meeting. But in verse 21, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and he taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. That's the anointing right there. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What, are, what new doctrine is this? For with authority commands he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee, long before social media. Let's pray. Bless the Father, we ask that in this day, again, Father, your purpose. Christ came to seek and save that which is lost, our great need, being lost sinners, redemption, salvation. Lord, again, to know you, to be known of you. And so, Lord, again, our hearts crying out that you would fulfill everything that you desire within us, through us, by us, for your honor and for your glory. And again, Lord, that these things, not new to us, but to them, Father, to behold right in front of them the very works of God. Again, Father, for eyes to see, and yet, Father, for the Pharisees, their hearts so hard, unbelieving, to reject anything that they would see or know by you. Lord, help us this day, for we have many a family and friends that are the same one, dispelling, unbelieving, hard-hearted, against the gospel, against you. What can break through that, Lord? other than your Holy Spirit, your great love. So, Father, we ask now, do your best work. Begin within us, Father, and may we take it to him. We pray these things for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's holy and most precious name, amen. Now you see that the practice here of verse 21, every opportunity that Christ had on the Sabbath, again, Sabbath was a day of rest, it was the day that they entered into the church, the, the, the temples, that they, that they had uh, the synagogues, and they would come in, and they would gather, open up the parchments, the Old Testament, and they would read from it, discuss it, share it, and grow from that. Now again, the Jews' lesson of the Word of God was supposed to be on the doorpost of the church. They were supposed to have reminders hanging in front of them, that when you walk, when you sit down, when you wherever he was, to have a conversation about the Word of God, about the things of God. Your practice, my practice today is not much different. Although it's hard to do today for a lot of people, one of the things to do is to work at this. How do you have a spiritual conversation no matter where you're at? No matter who you're with, stranger, co-worker, family member, let's talk about God. Let's just share about the things of God. Well, I was reading in my Bible this week. Well, I heard testimony Sunday about an answered prayer. What I saw God do this week. You know, great things of that. But you command the conversation with people. To turn it from, what did you think of that game last night? Boy, that's a lot of rain out there. And to spiritual things. To talk about God. To rehearse before God. What's the Lord been doing in your life? Have you been spirit-filled? Tell me how you got saved. Your divine, eternal questions that brings you back to these things of God. Where was we going? And Jacob wanted to play the game. We come back from Bridgeport. Yeah, okay, we was coming back, and I had, I had them in the car, and they was like, tell us, the, tell us again how, how you and, and Dad... Uh, we would be driving and, and to occupy our time, other than listening to the radio or vain conversation, whatever whatever street sign that you saw, you had to take that and, and to turn it around to spiritual, scriptural things of that. For example, as one was, 
Of course, that's an easy one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One way into heaven. Do not enter. <laughs> you know, well, I don't want to enter into hell, so yeah. do not enter here and pray. Those kind of things. So we played that game the other day to make the conversation about the things of God. And, you know, as you go down the highway, they keep repeating themselves, so it gets harder and harder as you come up with something other than what's already been said in that. But in the synagogue, it was a pointed saying about the Word of God. So now Jesus, teaching and preaching this new doctrine to them about the ways of God, they knew it, they had it in front of them, but they had rejected it. They had the parcels, they had the prophets, but they rejected it. So now here's Christ teaching them about the way of life, the way that the Father intends for them. Who's in the midst of the church? Who's in the midst of the church service sitting? An unclean spirit. An unclean spirit. In other words, a person with a demon. Which one is it? Which one is it? Huh? Come on, speak up. Which one have you got? <laughs> no point in putting it. <laughs> it cries out in the midst of that. Stop in church service. You ever been in the church service <coughs> where a demon took over? Only a couple times have I ever been there, but it's happened. I've seen it and unfolded. And the ones that are aware of this are the ones that are able to deal with this. If it would ever happen in some churches, they would freak out and they wouldn't be able to do it. You know? But again, you recognize the unclean spirit speaks out and says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus? Now they're testifying who he is. You can't even get some churches and Christians to testify who he is. You know, again, we're at the end of the tenth <coughs> month now, the last two months coming up, and there are still Christians, some of you, who have still not spoken eternity with anybody for ten months. That's a shame. That's a wretched shame. The church in China, you have to go every week and speak to someone about their eternity. Speak to them about their soul and communicate with them the gospel. It, it, it's a way of life for them. You have to read your Bible every day. You have to be in prayer every day. You have to be in church when the doors are open. And you have to take the gospel to other people. Those four things. And the fifth thing, which is unknown to us, you have to be willing to suffer for Jesus. We don't like that so much. I don't want to suffer. We pray for the opposite of that, don't we? Lord, don't let me suffer. Get me out of this suffer. Heal me. Deliver me from this. And then China, they're praying, take me into it. Now there's a doctrine that we don't like. Well, I don't know about that, Dan. First Peter, if you suffer in the flesh, you cease from sin. Every pain in the flesh is a reminder to us of what God has done for us. So again, you may whine and bellyache, ball baby. Uh, I, I call it ball, ball baby. baby. That's Dan <laughs> Bowser's term. That those things take us away, that we were more focused on that than to say, but what did my Jesus suffer? You have suffered in the flesh, you have ceased from sin. Suffering comes to make us draw closer to God. Suffering comes to bring us down to that place that we understand what this thing, life, is all about. And that we're getting ready to go into the next life, into heaven. I won't have to worry about suffering. I won't have to worry about pain. I won't have to worry about sorrow. I won't have to worry about sin. But I do have to here. I had one of the quotes on social media that I saw yesterday that really resonated with me from Jonathan Edwards. He said, have you ever thought about this? Is that all the heaven that most people that are going to hell will ever experience is right here. And all the hell that we will ever experience as Christians is right here, and we won't have to worry about it anymore. I didn't quote that exactly right, but you get the gist of it. The only thing of hell that I will ever have to endure of sin and sorrow is right here, right now. And however long I'm here on this earth, and that it will be gone. And I'll be at home forevermore. Any demons that I ever have to come up against, to fight, to wrestle, to fight against, is right here, right now, in this lifetime. I won't have to deal with that in eternity. I won't have to worry about Satan tempting me. I won't have to worry about him attacking me. I won't have to worry about him destroying me. 
You see what the demon said? Jesus, have you come to destroy us? What? What did he tell Mary and Joseph? And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He came to destroy them? <clears throat> he came to save them. And what's the demon crying out? You came to destroy us. Who's doing all the destruction and death that's out there today that we're seeing left and right? Who's the one destroying the homes today? Who's the one destroying the marriages today? Who's the one destroying society today? Satan. You can enter to Tennessee <coughs> and look at the, what do they call them, the alternative right? It's not, it's not alternative, is yeah. it? Is it? I think that's good. The right wing nuts, you know, yeah. against blacks, against this one, against that one. And on the other side, the opposite, you got the, I still ain't got it right, Antifa, A-N-T-I-F-A. Y'all don't even look at me like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Read the papers, folks. They're, they're having Civil War, 1860, down in Tennessee right now, and you got two sides of them fighting it out, and they're both wrong. They're both wrong. This side hates this side, this side hates this side, and they are all filled with hate. And all they are doing is destroying the nation right now. Trying to relive something that happened 150 years ago, yeah. 60 years ago. Yeah. It's just death. Destruction. Destruction. Mm -hmm. On our streets, in our cities, every rally, every rise, every death, every moment that comes in our society right now in these headlines that I'm talking about. Have you come to destroy us, though? No, he said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He created all this, and he created it perfectly, and he created it in order, and he established it. You go over to 1 Corinthians, and you see the establishment. I am God. I am supreme. Under Father, Son, Holy Spirit, angels, I have you as men, women, children, dog, cat, mouse, bird, whatever the rest of it is. There's an order. You don't break that order. And if you break out of that order, you've got chaos. You've got anarchy. When you stay in order, everything's fine. I don't expect the sun to come up in the west. Because he ordered it to come up in the east and to set in the west. He's established everything for his purposes. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill his purpose in this. And here we are fighting in this thing called life right now. And every time I turn on the news, and every time I see or listen to people, it's all about destruction. And here I got some demon spitting at my Savior some 2,000 years ago. What? Let us alone. Leave us alone. You ever know anybody say that? Mm -hmm. Hey, how about going to church with me? Hey, let me talk to you about your soul. Hey, can we have a holy conversation right now about where you're going to spend eternity? Leave me alone. I've known people that said that to the Holy Spirit. I told you that one of the most horrifying testimonies that I ever heard in all my life is that there was some man sitting in the church service, sitting there on a Sunday night church service, and the Holy Spirit convicting him, the invitation being given, the Holy Spirit drawing them, and he finally said to God, leave me alone. Fifty years later, he said, and God has left me alone. I've gone to preachers. I've gone to churches. I've gone to Bible studies. I have gone everywhere, high and low, seeking and asking God, please come back. Please speak to me one more time. And you know what he's done? He's left me alone. I cannot tell you. I know that there are horrors of life. I know that there are war-ravaged places that I would not want to be living in. I wouldn't want to be living in Mogadishu right now with the bombings. I wouldn't want to be living under ISIS where they beheaded the Christians and killed them. But to say to God, leave me alone, and God said, I've granted it. Do you know what it's like to get up in the morning and not have a God who is faithful? Great is thy faithfulness and not have a God watching over you. To jump in the car and go, to have your loved ones jump in the car and go, to say, well, they're, whim or way, they're on their own. I like having confidence that the children that I have, the loved ones that I have, my brothers and sisters in Christ and you that I pray for, 
I commit you into God's care and keeping. Is he able to keep you? Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faithful and blameless and holy in front of his presence. Are you us alone? What's our, what's our nation saying? Every time they say, take that cross down. Every time they say to the Christianity, keep your opinions to yourself. Every time they say to us, we don't believe that this is an abomination. This is a choice. This is a way of life. They're saying to God, leave us, you know, and what happens? God will someday say to us as a society, as a nation, you wanted that? Grant it. Who's saying it here? A demon. In the midst of the church, sir. There are churches that say that. Don't tell us what to do. I don't care what that book says. I'm going to do what I want to do. Leave me alone. You say, oh, no Christian. You're right, no Christian would. But this isn't a Christian, is it? This is a person, a religious person, a Jew, sitting in a synagogue on the Sabbath day, where they're supposed to be. But the only difference is they're demon-possessed. And I'm telling you, any time the gospel is ever presented, when people are sitting in church demon-possessed, there is a conflict. Duncan Campbell was preaching and he was telling about the Hebrides revival in 1953-54. They're in a house church. So they've got their downstairs, you know, the old, the old country two-story homes and the downstairs was all open and that. So the living room, the dining room, it's all open. People were standing only, standing only room there. And he, and he says, and we're getting up and we're singing songs and we're getting ready, to, I'm getting ready to preach. And he said, these two individuals Never seen them before. Didn't know. They enter into the, after the church service had already stopped. And they're standing over to the side. And he says, and I can tell by looking at them. They ain't right. He said, I had a 16-year-old boy that I could tell. Spirit-filled. And I could tell the moment that those two came in, the entire church service changed. Spirit was quenched. You could feel the resistance in the atmosphere against that. He said, I turned to that 16-year-old boy that I knew was in a right relationship with God and I said, pray. And he prayed 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and he called on the name of Christ and against the demons and against the forces of evil and hell and those two individuals got up and left and he said, and then broke loose with the Spirit of God. But the Conflict. You go out here in this world and we, they got every term for it now, other than what it is. An unclean spirit. Go, go say that to someone. And they'll say, no, I washed my clothes this week. What are you talking about? I'm zestfully clean. What are you talking about? I'm unclean. No, inside of you, you got a demon. You got an evil spirit working in you. That's the reason that you take the Lord's name in vain with no shame. That's the reason you can cuss like a sailor and not blush. Sorry to any Navy folks. Uh, you, get, you know what I mean. And, and you see this evil that's going on, like I said, about the mothers against their children and happening on the streets and the shootings and the gangs and all these other things. Right on down the line, I could go with all the evils going on. There's an unclean spirit that's dominating in our nation today. And the one people who've got the power to do anything about it is doing what? Um, nothing. Did you come to destroy him? Satan, Christ didn't come to destroy. Satan comes to destroy. And he is. I don't know about you, but I'm so sick and tired of watching homes be destroyed. I'm so sick and tired of watching lives being detrimental and forever ruined. The drug epidemic, the minds burned out, and the murder suicides, and the repercussions of that for the family. I mean, horrible, 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 and it's not just one and done. I keep coming every week and telling you these things. Satan is destroying our future. 50,000 died last year of drug overdose deaths. There'll be 60, 70,000 this year. How many homes affected? How widespread is the cancer? How widespread is the issues of life and death? It's everywhere. 
Where's the cry? Where's the heartache? Where's the pain? Lord, did you come? No, you came to redeem. You came to restore. You came to deliver. Where's the heart cry? And Jesus rebukes him right there on the spot. And he says, shut up. That's not in the King James. That's in Dan Bowser's yeah, translation. Yeah, say. Huh? The King James, uh -huh. hold your peace. That's such a polite way of saying it. Hold your peace and come out of him. I can honestly say to you, I've never cast a demon out. I've had demon people stand in front of me, but I didn't recognize it for what it was. I told you about Charleston where the woman got on the elevator talking to herself, and I didn't really realize what was going on because I was more in a defensive post. <laughs> Don't come at me. I'm going to drop you with one left hook. <laughs> I was over in, in, in Sweden, and we was doing a, a, a sharing the gospel there, and this mother, at the end of it, they was coming up and talking to us about American life and Christianity. And it was an auditorium full of parents and children, and this mother brings her little five, six-year-old child, some young son, stands in there, and she and I got an interpreter there, and, and she says, "Please pray for my son." Mother wants a blessing, right? Mother wants son to be saved, wants a blessing on their life, whatever it is. I said, "Well, what would you exactly like me to pray?" Well, he's got a demon. I look down at the boy; he looks back up at me. <laughs> I don't see it. Well, I, if there's anything, <coughs> how many times in scripture did we see where the demons entered into the children? I just read this morning in Mark 9 where the father brings the child to the disciples and the disciples couldn't cast the demon out. So Jesus and Peter, James, and John come down off the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus steps into the midst of this brouhaha and he says, what are you doing? And the father says, well, I brought my son to your disciples to cast out this demon, and they couldn't do it. And, and I'm begging of you, if there's anything that you can do. See, desperation, desperation, that's my child. If there's anything you can do to help me, help us. And Jesus said, how long ago has this been going on? He said, since a child. Now, Hannah comes home, she's in... in kindergarten, pre-K classes with this child that she has, and she tells us all the horror stories in kindergarten. I remember when kindergarten was finger painting and yeah, play doh and, play -Doh and running around out in the monkey bars and uh, tag and innocence. I don't remember when children come up and kick the adults in the shins and threaten them and fourth graders come and just say, I'm going to kill myself and I'm going to kill everybody else. Fourth graders. I don't remember that. That's, no, that's not my time. But that's what's in our society today. I hear those things, and I know the scriptures. Since a child, sometimes it's cast them into the fire. And sometimes it's cast them into the water to drown them. I prayed last night against when we were praying here, and I prayed against any suicide. Remember when I prayed that last night? And went home and down in Virginia, right here north of Richmond. But there was a standoff at the same hour that we were praying here. There was a standoff down there where a young man had a, was held up in a home and the police were outside and he ended up taking his life. And even though I prayed and even though I wrestled against that, not knowing what was going on, Still didn't, I, I didn't prevail. We didn't prevail. How, how much is he active today in the minds and the hearts of people? To get up tomorrow morning and someone to say, I want to go in New Hampshire. I, man, I was, I was really floored the other day. I went in New Hampshire. No doors locked. Nobody stopped me and said, who are you? What are you doing here? I'm like, oh my God, you can't get into Kaiser High School. Of course, I know you're going to say, well, that's Kaiser. Those, those vagabonds over there, yeah. you know. They needed a Kaiser. Well, hey, I, I know. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> but who's to say tomorrow when an unclean spirit goes into the mind, into the heart of someone planning and thwarting? What's next? Even though you're born coming, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, yeah, you said that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after the fact, you say, I told you so. 
Jesus says, hold up, he needs to come out of that. But authority is in the name of Jesus and in the voice of Jesus. Did the demon back talk him? You remember those days? There was no back talk. You spoke. Well, now, Dad, let's consider this. You know, I've contacted my lawyer, and he <laughs> said, <laughs> "It's compromise." Yeah, let's let's, let's negotiate yeah. here on this. When Jesus speaks and commands, it's done. And he, His word. This is the same word that said, "Let there be light." And there was light. <clears throat> no, no authority can stand against it. In the name of Jesus. What a powerful name. You all know that contemporary song that's out now? What a powerful name. I don't know who sings that. But I mean, it's got, it's got substance to it. You know, to speak against this evil of this day, to speak against the uh, issues of this life that we're living today. And all of we hear the name of Jesus in profanity. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Amen on TV, on the streets, in the schools, in the public forum, taking his name in vain, and even in the church. You see, if you speak his name, Jesus, without knowing who you're addressing, you're still speaking it in vain. To say a prayer, to say, in the name of Jesus, and Jesus says, but I don't know who you are. Did this demon know who he was? We know who you are. Thou art the Son of God, come to destroy us. And he says, stop, shut up, and come out of him. Isn't it amazing that even demons know who he is? So how foolish, how utterly stupid is it for our loved ones to say, well, I know who he is. You've heard me say it a, a, a thousand times over there in First John and in the book of James where he says, even the devils know who he is. And here's the evidence of that. And I come across people, you come across people, oh yeah, I, I know who God is, I believe in God, I know who Jesus is. Well, that don't mean squat. If you don't fear him, revere him, and follow him. And in this he says, and he commands that, now look at the response of the demon. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried, with a loud voice, he came out of him. Evidence that that boy had now been, that, that man there had now been released by this demon. And they were all amazed. Boy, I'm telling you, give him something to talk about, right? We have never seen anything like this. Can you imagine that? All the iPhones come out and the selfies come out. Hey, YouTube uploads and the Facebook and all that stuff. Man, it would be broadcast, and his fame went out immediately. You know what they did. They left the synagogue, and the first people that they come in contact with is that they said what? You'll never guess what we just saw. It's not normal for us to see demons cast out. But I'm telling you, you talk about, you know the old saying, fish in a barrel? That's, you got fish in a barrel, you got limits, you just reach in there and grab one, right? Isn't that why y'all keep goldfish in the thing? You just <laughs> right. supper? What are we having for supper tonight? What's well, right there, you know? <laughs> grab and go, right? <laughs> Play a fish. Better than the dog. <laughs> yeah. How many demons are out there in our society today? You might go back, you might go back twenty years, forty years, hundred years or something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> you, you can go back. <laughs> Well, I don't know that I've ever seen a demon. I don't know that we ever had this issue before. It has always been. It's just been they've been under disguise before. You know, listen to Dad tell the accounts when he worked on the mental ward as a nursing assistant. Listen to those things. You scare us as kids. He didn't wait till we was adults to tell us that. He told us that as bedtime stories. <laughs> yeah, great, great child abuse, child yeah. abuse. But you see and knew this isn't normal. This isn't normalcy for people. This is demonic in this day and age. This grip of addiction, it's not normal. It's de 
demonic. It's destruction. It's death and dying. And no syllables. D, D, D. Death, dying, destruction. Devouring. That's poor Ds. It is by the deity who is from hell, the devil. Because life is the, life in Christ and life in God is the exact opposite. Of it. it is freedom. It is redemption. It is salvation. It is deliverance when Christ steps in. We don't, we're not fighting the warfare. We're not fighting a good fight against it. We're not wrestling. You know, I've watched Joshua used to wrestle and go out there and you watch these kids and they didn't even try. You know, they all like belly flopped over and pinned me and let, let me get off get out of it. They had no desire to fight the fight. They didn't they didn't want to. You gotta love when the underdog steps up and says, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care what your record is. You got you got to fight on your hands. You got to love that spirit in people. And I'm telling you, that same spirit has got to be within the church today, saying, "Satan, I don't <coughs> care how much how much homes you've destroyed. I don't care how many lives you've destroyed. I don't care who you are. Greater is He that is in me than He that's in this world. And in the name of Jesus." Get out. I'm telling you, there are some people that need to be delivered today, isn't there? Any names faces come to your mind? Yeah. Got a long one with the lips. Struggling. Heartbroken. Day in and day out. Failed. And there is no help for that. But in Christ. We know that. <coughs> Faith knows that. That's the reason. Anytime. Just like last night. Anytime there's a prayer meeting, anytime that there's a Christian individual or church that says, hey, I'm going to get serious about this thing, you just know Satan is going to show up and say, well, we'll serve you. Rob, you, trick you, stop you. He knows that our authority and our power is against him in this. And he knows to undo that, there is nothing that the government can do against him. There is nothing nations can do against him. His only adversary in this world is the children of God, the church. And in that name of Jesus, disciples come. Why could we not cast him out? We did it before. Jesus had sent them out two by two. They cast out demons, healed the sick, done great miracles. They had done it before. Why couldn't we do this one in Jesus? Remember what he said? Because of your unbelief. You could say a thousand prayers today and only skeptically say, well, I pray. Well, I, I ask in the name of Jesus. Well, good. But that don't mean it got done. You pray so as to prevail. I will not be denied this week. My loved one is at stake. Their eternity is at stake. And if you don't intervene, if you don't step in, they're going to be the foolish ones that stand up and say, leave me alone. you imagine your loved one coming to you sitting down saying, yeah, i got something I want to tell you. I know you've been praying for me. I know you're concerned about me. But, you know, I finally had it out with God last night. And in my bedroom sitting there, I just finally said to God, leave me alone. I know what horror, after you've heard me preach it, I know what horror would fill your soul for any of your loved ones to sit down at the table and to tell you that. Do you realize how close they are to that? Do you realize how much it is is that you have to be moved, stirred, spurred to action to say, I won't let that happen. I will not let that happen. After the fact does no good. Before the fact matters. That's why today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepting time. Today's the moment that we have. I haven't got to tomorrow yet. It ain't come. And I can't do anything about yesterday. It's already set in stone. But I do have today the same as you. And the demons are out there. And they're doing their best job of sinking our nation and destroying it. And you and I, small though we be, small remnant the church is. You know, I talk about the gay and lesbian movement being less than 2%. In our, in our 330 million in the United States, there's only 2% if that, and I'm being kind. But guess what the church is? 
it ain't much bigger than that. We're at five percent. And then that's a small group to impact what's going on out there today. But you know what the difference is? We got the name of Jesus. We got the power, the Pentecostal power. We got a Holy Spirit that can do like what we talked about, fill fill a building, fill a property, seed in souls, captivate them, come to them in their dreams, answer our prayers when we say, in the name of Jesus. I read it this morning. These are some of the first verses I ever memorized in the Bible. 15, 16 year old kids sitting on the back pew on Wednesday nights during choir practice, memorizing verses left and right like I was just going out, like they were going out of style. Candy corn, like going out of style. And one of them was Mark 11, 24. I'm in the book of Mark in my Bible readings. That's the reason this verse come up as it was coming through there. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. You want your joy to be full today? Want your cup to run over? Ask in my name, and it shall be. <coughs> Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. Ask. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. What great promises. And all of it on the stick. If we do what we're supposed to do, he'll do what he's supposed to do. And what happens to the enemy? What happens to the demon? What happens to the unclean? You know, where'd that unclean spirit go? Gone. You like when he's over there in the book of uh, in, in Luke, when, when the legion had a hold of that guy, and they're out there, and, and Jesus, and then he says, don't torment us. Let, send us out into the hillside. There, there's 2,000 hogs out there. Send us into them. And Jesus says, well, then go. And they got in the hogs and they ran off the cliff. You like that? <laughs> hmm? That's bacon, man. Sausage. <clears throat> Bet everybody there. Cast them out. Even legion. Because of Christ. Legion is out there. It's not just the individual. It's the mass. And we still have the authority in the name of Jesus. Get out. You have no right here. You have no claim here. That's for our nation. That's for our future. That's for our loved ones. That's for our home. That's for our school. You can't find Christ in this society today. It's so small. That's the reason it is so important that every one of us that does bear the image of Christ be what we're supposed to be. Why could we not cast them out? Because of your unbelief. This kind comes forth, but nothing but prayer and fasting. When's the last time you fasted? For the sake of the gospel. That's what we're up against. We have the authority. We have the power. But I'm telling you, he speaks a false truth there, a half-truth. Have you come to destroy us? Yeah, he did come to destroy their kingdom, didn't he? He did come to destroy the powers of darkness and the power of hell. He came to, he came to be conqueror. That's the reason that his title over in Revelation, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am it, then there is none of us. And every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, including Satan and including all these demons. They will bow. We know who you are. But it will not rescue them. It will not redeem them. And you and I come across people today. Oh, we know who he is. I, I was baptized. I joined it. Yeah, but you're not following him. You're not obeying him. You don't love him. There's a difference. So it is in this. You're going to come across it's there. That's what we're fighting against. And again, the old adage, know your enemy. Do you know the enemy? Some Baptists think it's other Baptists. Republicans think it's Democrats. <laughs> on and on and goes. <coughs> this is our enemy. The unclean spirit that claims the souls and the lives of our loved ones. And it's a horrible thing to watch. 
man, I've watched it in my kids, detrimental. Detrimental to their choices and their decisions, what, what Satan has done to them. And here I am as a dad, knowing these things, fighting tooth and nail. You can't have them. I'll close with this. You know, we talk about the, the sex trafficking and creating a praise for it so much. Up there in New York City, Brooklyn. I don't know if you all saw this or not. But every every day you see it. Child abducted, child disappears. You know, who's got, did they run away? Did they, did someone snatch them? On, you know, it's just so much chaos out there to concern them. So these two girls disappeared. 16, 17 years old. Father frantic. They got him. They got him. The gang took him. Whatever. Daughter has her cell phone. She pings her location on her cell phone to her dad. FBI goes in, recovers the girl. Now I read that story. Time and time again. To know how quick it could happen. Snatched. Gone. You know what that father, in a moment of urgency, fear, just utter despair to get that pain? It's her. In the moment, the moment that the FBI brings the daughter back and says, there she is, safe and sound. All honor, glory, and praise to you, Lord. The father of the of the prodigal son, standing there on the porch, day, night, three times a day, looking out that road. Are they ever coming home? Will I ever see them again? That day, that day, it's going to come. This my son was dead. And now is what? Alive. Put a robe on his back. Put ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet. You know what it is? You have no right to my son, to my daughter, to my husband, to my wife, to my mother, to my father, to my brother, to my sister. You have no right to our nation. Other than the attitude of, well, whatever will be, will be. Nah, no big deal. It'll all work itself out. You might believe that. I don't. I know what we're up against. But I know the authority and the power in the name of Christ. Not on my watch. Not on my responsibility. Prevail to the glory and the honor of the kingdom. That's what we're here for. Make me what I'm supposed to be. Spirit fill me. Take me. Use me. Eternity is in the balance for someone today that don't pray for themselves and the only prayer that God will ever hear from them is from you. Get out and leave them alone in the name of Jesus. And they got to do it. They've got to listen to the authority of the name of Jesus. Oh, that we may believe before it's too late. Let's close in prayer.